many, many, many opportunities to share your word. I don't want to ever get comfortable with it. I want to stay resting in your spirit and your power. May I never think I got this. May I believe without question that I need you each time. And I acknowledge that right here today. And Father, I ask now that you would give us eyes to see, that you give us ears to hear, and as you promised, and we're going to see in your word, that you would empower us to live this out. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, listen to what Paul says in verses 6 and 7. He says, For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Listen to what he says. I fought the good fight. Now jump back to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to look at verse 12. Where Paul writes Timothy in his first letter. And he tells Timothy in verse 12, Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So Paul at the end of his life said, I fought the fight. Yet he also had told Timothy, fight, fight the fight. Now what we're going to do and the conundrum we're going to wrestle with today is, I'm going to show you a couple of places in the Bible that also say that we're not supposed to fight, but we're supposed to let God fight for us. So go with me real quick to Exodus chapter 14. Go to Exodus chapter 14. Nation of Israel's caught between the Red Sea and the bearing down Egyptians and Pharaoh, and they're a little scared. And as, as, uh, Exodus chapter 14, verse 14, listen to what the scripture says. And if I turn to Exodus, I could get there with you. There we go. Exodus 14, verse 14. It says, The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. Go over to Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. By the way, as you're turning there, Nehemiah is one of the shortest people in the Bible. You know that, right? Nehemiah. All right. That was free. He was taller than Bildad the shoe height, though, that's for sure. But no, none of them were as small as the guard who slept on his watch. Go to Roman. I'm sorry, Nehemiah chapter 4. You're going to get me distracted with bad jokes. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 20. It says, in the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, our God will fight for us. So, I've just shown you two places where the scripture says God will fight for us, yet Paul says, I fought the fight, and he tells Timothy, fight the fight. So how do we fight the fight, but have God fight for us? That's what we're going to wrestle with today. That before we answer that question, there's a couple things you need to know. The first thing you need to know is this, your fight is not against flesh and blood. Boom. Your fight, Ephesians chapter 6 tells us, is not against flesh and blood. Go look real quickly at chapter 6 of Ephesians and look at who your fight is against. If I were to ask you, uh, who's your fight against, a lot of you would say, Satan. Well, you take a good look. It's bigger than that. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. It says in verse 10, well, we'll just jump to verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, plural, mm -hmm. against the authorities, mm -hmm. plural, mm -hmm. against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Folks, your battle is not just against Satan. It's against Satan and all his minions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That leads to the second thing we got to understand. First of all, your fight is not against flesh and blood. Mm. Your fight's against the cosmic forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And that hopefully helps you understand the second thing you need to understand. Uh, your enemy is way stronger than you are. That's why 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Amen. We don't win this battle in this fight by fighting Satan ourselves. Even the book of Jude tells us that the archangel Michael is way more powerful than you or I would not bring accusation against Satan, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. Years ago, when I was pastor at First Baptist in the Atlantic, 
uh, we took a little vacation. Someone had given us passes to Disney for our family as a gift, and we went over to go do Disney for a little bit, but instead of paying the prices to stay at the Disney resorts, we got a resort off-site of Disney, and they're off of 192, and it had a nice little suite area with a kitchen and all this stuff. It had a, it had a um, one of those Murphy beds you could pull out of the wall. The kids, we used to have fun putting the kids in it and then closing it up. <laughs> they thought that was the greatest thing. It's hard to imagine our kids now, the size and the age they are, all three of them fitting into that bed, just closed up in the wall one day. Well, while we were over there, uh, some friends of ours who had family uh, and kids the same age as ours, they came over to visit because we had a nice suite and we had the kitchen area and everything. And when they came over to spend time with us that night and we fed, ate dinner together, they brought a big plate of chocolate, co chocolate chip cookies. Mm -hmm. And the kids were all wanting to eat them. And we just said to them, look, here are the instructions. You're welcome to have a chocolate chip cookie whenever you want. You could have it before dinner. You could have it after dinner. But you only are allowed one chocolate chip cookie. They were big chocolate chip cookies. But we said, look, we're on vacation. You don't have to wait till after dinner. You want it now, you can have it now. If you want it after dinner, you have it after dinner. But you only get one. Is it understood? Yes. So, of course, not a kid waited until that. <laughs> they all ate their cookies, and then the meal goes on and everything, and it's time for that family to leave. And as we're all at the door saying goodbye to this family as they're heading out, I'm counting heads, and I realize one of our three kids is missing. And I turned around, and I saw my daughter, Elise, she's about four years old, over in the corner like this, in the corner of the wall. And I knew exactly what was going on. She had seized her opportunity to sneak another cookie while everybody was at the door saying goodbye. So as we closed the door, I turned around and I said, Elise, she turns around, she's got chocolate all over her face. I sat her down on the couch. I said, Elise, did you have one of the cookies that we already said you only could have one and you just had another one? Yes, Daddy. I said, you did understand that we said only one. Yes, Daddy. I said, then you got to explain to me why you took another one. This is her answer. It's stuck in my head for years, and I've been preaching it for years. In tears, she burst it out, and she said, Daddy, I knew I wasn't supposed to do it, but when I walked by the table and the cookies were there, the cookies were too strong for me. <laughs> I said, girl, that'll preach. <laughs> Your enemy is way more powerful than you are. Well, you need to fight the fight with an understanding that you're not fighting against humans. You're, not. you're fighting against the spiritual forces of evil. Yep. And your enemy is way too strong for you. So how do we fight the good fight of the faith, but let God do the fighting for us? So actually, the context of those two passages that we started with give us our answer. Go back to 2 Timothy 4. I'm going to just tell you now, and I'll show it to you in the context. How we fight the fight is we actually do what God says to do. We walk in obedience to what God has said to do, but we trust that God will give us the power Amen. to do what it is, or God will make it work out the way He wants to make it work out. Look at 2 Timothy 4. We'll start in verse 14. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. I'm going to get him back. Is that what he says? No, it's not at all what he says. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Mm -hmm. He says, Beware of him yourself, though, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into His heavenly kingdom. To Him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Notice Paul's attitude toward the people that were against him and the Christians who let him down. Mm. The people that are against him, God's going to take care of them. I don't have to fight it. I'm going to fight by... Well, go back to what he says in verse 6 and 7. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Listen to verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept what? Faith. faith. The faith. I have kept my faith in God. I've kept my eyes on the Lord. I haven't tried to take things into my own hands. 
I've rested in God's ability to do what he said he would do. And his word said, vengeance is mine. Wow. I'll take care of that. So I leave that to him. And the people that did me wrong, the Christian brothers and sisters that disappointed me, I'm not angry at them. I'm actually hoping God doesn't hold it against them. Amen. They sin just like I sin. They disappoint me just like I disappoint others. And by the way, those words, if you do a study, you go back and look, you'll see those are the exact same words Jesus told his disciples the night that he was going to be betrayed and the night he, the, the trial was going to become, was going to begin. He says to him, Tonight you're all going to go away. Hmm. But I won't be alone. Ooh. My father will be with me. What did Paul say? When at my first defense, no one stood by me, they all left, may it not be held against them. Hmm. And I wasn't alone anyway. I was with the Father was with me. He's He's always with me, wow. and He'll rescue me from every evil deed. Go back to First Timothy chapter six. Listen to what Paul tells tells Timothy in chapter six, starting in verse eleven. But it, as for you, O man of God. Flee these things. Pursue righteousness. There's things we're to do. We don't just sit back and say, well, God's going to fight the fight. No, we act in obedience to what He said, but we trust that He's the one that's going to make it work. We know what He said and we do what He says. Pursue righteousness. Flee unrighteousness. God, pursue godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Wow. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and which you have made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ mm. which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Keep reading. And then he says to the, he goes on, he says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, to ready to share, <laughs> thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold, there it is again, take hold of that which is truly life. O oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what's falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Folks, listen to me carefully. I'm going to show you from the Scriptures. You want to fight the fight? You keep your eyes on Jesus and you spend time with Him in His Word and you spend time obediently acting on what He has said, trusting that He's going to make it work out and you don't get distracted by all the other stuff mm. that's going to try to come in. Mm. Doesn't the Bible say in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, to throw aside the sin that so easily entangles and run with endurance, perseverance, the race marked out for us by doing what? Good. Fixing our eyes yeah. on Jesus. <clears throat> Folks, there's a lot of things going on out there that could distract us, could they not? Amen. I mean, we could even spend a lot of time talking about gas prices this morning. <laughs> Please don't. It's going to get worse tomorrow. It's going to get worse tomorrow. It could, could get, who knows? It could get worse and worse. I, and, and right now, it rushes the enemy. Mm. But do you pray for the Russians? By the way. Yeah. I mean, think about this. Do you, mm. Think how bad they got it right now. Yeah. The Ukrainians have it bad, but the Russians aren't having it any better. Mm -mm -mm. I actually heard this this joke yesterday about this guy. Do you remember Yakov Shmirnov, yeah, the yeah, comedian? Yeah, yeah. He yeah. told the joke yesterday that I heard about a Russian who went to go buy a car. And so he went to the dealership and they said, you won't be able to get a car for 20 years. We don't have cars. So I tell you what, sign your name on this piece of paper and come back in 20 years and you'll have a car. The guy says, do you want me to come back in the morning or in the afternoon? <laughs> and the dealer says, well, what difference does it make? You're coming back in 20 years. What difference does it make whether you come back in the morning or the afternoon? Well, the guy says, well, I got the plumber coming in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, the honest attitude of us is to say, Lord, I want to keep my eyes on you. Yes, and the, we, we think we have it bad, but no, I've got the Lord. And everything else, everything that comes to me is from His hand. Even the struggles. Once you've been put in Christ, 
Nothing can touch you unless the Father allows it. That's and if right. He allows it, He has a good purpose. purpose. Thank you. All things will work together for the good for those who are called according to His purpose and yes. love Him. Yes. And He's predestined to conform us into the image of Jesus. And if Jesus learned obedience through what He suffered, who thinks we're not going to go through that as well? But we get distracted into politics and all this other stuff. And let me just tell you, you're going to get swerving from the faith. Amen. You want to fight the good fight? <clears throat> You walk in obedience to Jesus on a daily basis, keeping your eyes on Him. And you just do what He says, trusting Him to make it work out. Oh, by the way, that means you trust Him to make it work out in His time. Yes, sir. Yeah. See, one of our problems is we'll say, all right, Lord, I trust you. You've got a week. <laughs> we don't ever say those words, but we mean it. Mm -hmm. Because we trusted and a week later, it didn't happen. Amen. And we're discouraged, we're upset, it doesn't work. What you really are saying is, Lord, I trust you, but you've got a week. <laughs> Folks, let me just say this to you. The Bible is full of passages, and I'm just going to bomb you with them real quick in the time we have here. The Bible is full of passages that illustrate this. Oh, by the way, uh, those two passages we looked at about allowing God to fight for you, you go back and look at Exodus 14. The very next verse, right after he says you're going to just watch God fight for you, all you have to do is be silent. Mm -hmm. The very next words, God says, now go forward <laughs> and walk through the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. They had to act on what God had said, trusting that He was going to make it work. Mm. The other one in Nehemiah, um, how rally, he had the sound of the trumpet, ra trumpet rally to us and God will fight for us there. That's the whole story of them rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and they're having to fight with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other trying to... You're not going to fight real good with one hand mm. and the other hand mm. trying to fix the wall. And mm. you're not going to fix the wall real well with one hand doing this and the other hand doing something else. But you know what? You do what God says and you can trust Him to make it work. Amen. Let me just bomb you with some of these verses. Go to James chapter 4. We're going to hit this fast. So if you can't keep up, write them down. Pull out your phone. Make a note. Because I want you to spend some time allowing the Spirit of God to allow these words, these scriptures to get into your heart. <coughs> Meditate on these. Let the truth of these sink in. James chapter 4 verses 6 and 7. James chapter 4 verses 6 and 7 says this. He says, but He, God, gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Hang on a second. Do you fight Satan here? What do you no. do? Resist. Resist. We, sub we resist, and we just back up into the robes of Jesus. And He doesn't leave because of us. He leaves because of who? Yes, sir. Jesus. Because of Jesus. I've shared this story before. Some of you probably remember it. Some of you don't. Years ago when I was playing basketball in college, back in Flagler College in St. Augustine, Florida, at that time our dorm was the Henry Flagler Hotel. And we were down on the bottom floor, and I was on the basketball team, and the guy, my roommate at the time was named Bob, and he actually was a six foot six, 260-pound guy that physically was a specimen like you wouldn't believe. He literally was built like a, a, like a professional wrestler. He looked like Hulk Hogan. He had the long blonde hair and everything. And he, was, he literally would have fun going through the dining hall and, and going through the cafeteria line and this, the ladies who were serving our food. He, he'd like to, he would wear tank tops and point out what he wanted with his pectoral muscles. <laughs> he'd say, I want one of some of those. And they'd go, you know. <laughs> well, the man was huge. But one night, we were in our dorm room. And there were some high school kids just outside the dorm room who were making a whole lot of noise. He rose, raised the window and he said, hey, knock it off, boy, we're trying to study. And a voice from outside in the dark said, there are boys out here if you want to do something about it. Bob turned to me and he said, Jim, let's go, we're going to fight them. I go, Bob, I'm not fighting. <laughs> I've been beat up a few times, but I've never been in a fight in my life. He goes, well, either you come with me and help me fight these guys, or I'm going to go deal with them and then come back and deal with you. I said, okay. So I'm not kidding you. I go with him, and I'm walking behind Bob. As he goes out the door, there's all these guys out there. He takes his shirt, rips it off, and says, let's go. Let me just tell you what a size man this was. He could literally stand underneath a basketball goal, have each of two people do this and hang on to his shoulders 
and he could still jump up and dunk the basketball. Oh. The man was huge. He became a professional wrestler. He goes, let's go! And they took off. <laughs> and all of them just took off. And I said, we took care of that, right? We took care of that. I didn't do squat. They didn't run from me. They might not have even ever seen me. When you submit yourself to God, you just resist Him. You just resist him by spending your time looking at the Father, talking to the Father. He's whispering all this stuff in your ear. He's throwing all this stuff at you via the computer or whatever it is. You just turn your back on him and keep talking to God. Mm. And then he's going to notice who you're talking to. Mm. And he's not going to stick around. Mm. You ever noticed how the demons all reacted when they saw Jesus? Mm. <laughs> you're going to send it to the abyss for the appointed time? We know who you are. That same God lives within you. That's right. Oh, but when you started getting all cocky and saying, I'll take you on, mm. he says, let's go. Mm. Mm -hmm. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Look at verses 28 and 29. Colossians 1, 28 and 29. Paul says, Him, Jesus, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Mm. For this I toil... Struggling, but listen, with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. I do what he says to do, but I trust him to make it work out. I'm going to be honest with you today. I don't know why. I woke up today just exhausted. I, I can't explain it. I don't know what's going on, but I just woke up exhausted. We actually had the plumber, sorry, not the plumber, the, the, the sprinkler guy come and do some work at our house this morning. And I had a couple other things I had to do before I got here. And i be honest with you, I've been praying the whole time sitting here, Lord, may the prayer requests go longer. May they sing another <laughs> verse. I'm just taking a break. I just need rest. And when I got into the preaching opportunity time today, I literally am walking in saying, Lord, you're going to make this work. Mm. You're going to have to make this work. Paul says, I toil, I struggle, but not in my strength. In his. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Mm -hmm. For it's God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Look at that, that conundrum there. Look, he says, look, I want you to work out your salvation. Take it serious, yet at the same time, understand it's God who gives you the desire and the ability to work it out. We take serious how we fight the fight as we hang on to the faith. We do what He says to do. We leave the results to Him. We keep our eyes on Him. We're not distracted by what happens or doesn't happen or when it happens or when it doesn't happen. We're not distracted by whether or not people like what we say or don't like what we say. We just keep our eyes on Jesus. And that's how you fight the fight. Thank you, Lord. That's how you finish the race. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at verses 10 and 11. <clears throat> as each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves, listen, by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. How many times have we heard someone in church saying, I've been working hard and no one's helping me. Mm. Well, you just said something right there, didn't you? Mm. Yeah, you're doing all the work and no one's helping you. Well, that means you're not resting in Jesus. Amen. Because if you think no one's helping you, that you've just said that Jesus, you're not Amen. letting Him help either. Amen. Again, we... We, we know these things. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Keep an eye on our time here so I can let you get back to work. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verses 16 and 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, may He comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Mm -hmm. We're to be doing, but trusting Him. Amen. Go to Philipp, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, look at verses 1 through 5. Finally, brothers, pray for us 
that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful. See, my eyes aren't just on that. My eyes are on Him. The Lord is faithful. He'll establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you're doing and will do the things that we command. <clears throat> May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. There it is. Do, 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 but don't think you're doing it. Amen. I want an honest answer right now. I want honest. Have I told you anything that you hadn't already heard? Have I told you anything today that you don't already know? No. No. Everything I've said, you knew. Well, besides the stories. <laughs> Let me say this. Then what's our problem? What's our problem? I know this. You know this. Yet we keep falling. How come? Well, I'll tell you what our problem is. It's called our flesh. It's our flesh. Our flesh wants credit. Amen. Our flesh wants to be in charge. That problem of Adam and Eve, you get to be like God, you get to determine right and wrong. Even though we have been set free from the, the consequences of that sin, the effects of it are still in our body, are they not? Yes. That's why Paul says, I wrestle. Things I want to do, I don't. Things I don't want to do, I do. I got this problem with me. In my inner being, I want to do the will of God now. But I got this other problem, it's my flesh there rooting against me and working against me. Go real quick to Matthew 16. Let me show you. Maybe this will make you feel better. Peter had the same problem. Matthew 16, look at verses 13 through 23. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist back from the dead. Others say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Now Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who's in heaven. And I tell you, you're Peter now. I had told you earlier that you were, your name was Simon, but one day you'd be Peter. You're Peter now. And on this rock, your profession of your faith, I will build my church. Mm. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Well, that's another thing for another time. Look at verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter, the same one who had just said, you are the Christ, the same one who had his eyes opened by the power of the Father, the same one who was a new creation now, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Now, I'm going to ask you a tough question. Don't jump to an answer. Pray it through, think it through before you answer. When Jesus turned and said, get behind me, Satan, you don't have in mind the things of man, but the things of, things of God, but things of man, was he talking to Satan, or was he talking to Peter? Both. The answer is both. Mm -hmm. He knew who was talking through Peter, and that's why he said, get behind me, Satan. I know who's really talking. My battle's not against Peter. This is a little bit deeper than just Peter. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, Peter, you're letting Satan talk through you mm -hmm. because your flesh has in mind the things of man. Yeah. I'm going to tell you straight up, and especially us men, we got this problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust the Lord with all your heart. Yes. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Don't, don't miss that. Trust in the Lord with your whole heart. Never, ever, 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 ever lean on your own understanding. In everything, check with God first, and He'll show you what to do. How many of you do that every day? No, sir. Exactly. How many of you, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands here, because I, I, I know the honest answer, and I don't want you to lie now and embarrass yourself. <laughs> How many of you, most of the time, jump to not obeying Proverbs 3, 5, mm. and 6, mm. but have to be reminded to go back and check with God. Mm. If you're honest, mm -hmm. all of us. Mm -hmm. What's our problem? Our so. flesh. You guys want to worship God? Mm. Worship isn't what happens on Sunday morning. Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. The Bible actually says that worship <clears throat> is daily laying your flesh on the altar. Mm -hmm. 
Saying no to the flesh and yes to the spirit. Mm. This fighting the fight, that's worship. Mm. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, what you eat, what you drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Listen to Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beg you, I beseech you, I plead with you, therefore, brothers, because of God's mercy, mm. offer your bodies yeah. as a living okay. sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. Actually, some translations put it well when they say your spiritual act of worship. Amen. Some actually even say reasonable service of worship. I think mm. that's great. You want to worship God? Practice walking in the Spirit. Mm. Practice. You're going to make mistakes. You're not going to do it perfectly. But hopefully over time you'll get better and better and better. Mm -hmm. As you learn to say yes to Jesus and no to the flesh. So what's our answer? Our problem is our flesh. The answer, how we fight the fight, well, we've already touched on it. You fix your eyes on Jesus. Yes, sir. You throw aside the things that easily entangled. And you run with perseverance, the race marked out for you. Mm. We're in a hurry to get somewhere. We're in a hurry to see results. We're in a hurry to become the Christian we always wanted to be. And that's why some of those churches will fill up for a split second or for a few months where supposedly the Spirit of God's getting poured out and all these people are running down the aisle and all these lives are being changed. For a minute. Have you ever noticed how after the big quote-unquote revival, most of those churches just fall flat? Mm. Mm. Y'all been in this area long enough, I could name names, you could name names. God's real work doesn't happen with a special preacher praying a certain prayer, laying his hands on you. My God. God begins his work and he finishes his work, but he has his, ter his, his purposes and his seasons and his times. Mm -hmm. That's why the book of James says the farmer waits patiently for wow. the former and the later rain. That's why the Bible says in Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, that the one who is blessed by God, who meditates on His Word day and night, will produce its fruit in its season. Mm. You, you want to run the race with perseverance? You want to finish the fight? You keep hold of the faith today. <laughs> and then tomorrow. Yes, sir. And then the next day. Don't worry about Thursday. Mm. Run the race today. <coughs> Keeping your eyes on Jesus. And guess what? One day, when the race is done, you can honestly say, like Paul, I... he's going to be reward. He's going to reward me. Mm -hmm. Because well, how did he? How did he end? Listen to what he says here. He says in verse seven, he said, "I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith." Now listen to verse eight. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Mm -hmm which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, mm. and not only to me, wow. but also to all who have loved His Coming. appearing. Mm -hmm. He says, He doesn't say, and He'll reward all those who busted their family as hard as I did. <laughs> no. I've kept the faith. Mm. I've kept my eyes on the Lord. He's going to reward me for that. Guys, I love you. We'll see you next time I come out.